Um, good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Mickey McComb Coves. I'm the executive director of Ocean First Institute, and I'm really grateful that you turned out tonight for our virtual social. Um, I really appreciate you taking time out of your night tonight um, to share uh, the evening uh, with Dr. Chris Malinowski. Um, he is a dear friend of mine. I've known him for over 10 years. Uh, and he is an amazing uh, scientific researcher and we share a lot of the same passions. And I am so thrilled uh, that he came all the way from South Florida to be with us tonight virtually um, as well as physically. Uh, and I just uh, am really excited uh, for him to be able to share some of the research that he's had on his um, research journey. Uh, and so Chris, uh, just so you know a little bit about him, he grew up in uh, Wisconsin and uh, he got his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Wisconsin, uh, working in the Great Lakes, uh, where he developed his uh, true love for fish and all things aquatic. Uh, and then he and I crossed paths when he did his master's degree down at FAU um, in Florida, where he was studying dolphins uh, while I was studying sharks. And so we became instant friends. Um, he then uh, left and did his PhD up at Florida State, um, working on an incredible project, uh, working uh, in a collaborative setting with many different researchers after the Deep Horizon oil spill and trying to look at the impacts uh, on all kinds of wildlife from fish to sharks to turtles to dolphins, um, working with a big consortium. Um, he did that incredible work and uh, really um, gained an appreciation for his work on fish. He later did a postdoctoral um, stint at Purdue uh, and now is a research biologist at the South Florida Water Management District. Um, so as I said, Chris and I have been friends for a very long time and he is a um, super speaker. He is a fantastic biologist. Um, he has worked a lot on groupers, as you can see from his uh, photos. Uh, he's going to take us on a journey tonight to tell us the stories of some of the species he's worked on and talk about his uh, real desire and his real interest in conservation, uh, which is really something that the Institute holds near and dear. So without any further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Chris Malinowski. Cool. Well, thank you, Graham, and thank you, Mickey, for the wonderful introduction. I, I heard most of it in our technical difficulties. <laughs> and I also I'll say that I, I appreciate Mickey befriending me when I was working on dolphins, because for any of you that know, there's a, there's a conflict between the, the shark and the dolphin world, and often we, we tease each other. So it, it's, been, it's been cool. Um, we, we've known each other for a long time. And, and like Mickey said, my, my background, my interest is, is largely in conservation. I, um, I've done a lot of different things as I'll go through today. Um, kind of the, the theme of, of this talk is going to be sort of an overview of a lot of the different types of research and involvement I've had in really in conservation work. And, um, and I'm going to kind of stay light on the science tonight in terms of like results. Like a lot of scientists, I typically get up and show a bunch of figures and graphs. I'm, I'm getting a little bit lighter on that and, and more pictures and storytelling. So if any of you have interest, deeper interest in a lot of the stuff I talk about tonight, my email on, on that screen right now is on there. Feel free to email me. You can contact me. Um, my website is also there and I've got papers that you can read if you want to read more detail about some of the stuff. So, so, I'll, so um, without further ado, I'll get into um, sort of going through a timeline of starting from when I did meet Mickey, which was when I moved from Wisconsin, where I did my undergraduate, as she mentioned, I had actually originally started working on fish there in, in the Great Lakes, um, doing research experience for undergraduates, internships. And then I said, you know what, I want to do something completely different. So I flew to Florida, started a master's program at, at Florida Atlantic University, working um, where you can see off the east coast of Florida and the Bahamas, particularly off of Little Bahama Bank. And uh, how do I get rid of that? Oh, you heard of that bar? Oh, at the top. Yeah, so I can see my full screen. Um, One second. Yeah. I can't see my. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll pretend like I know what's on there. So, um, so 
Yeah, so basically I, I got into trying to understand dolphin foraging and behavior, uh, particularly of uh, bottlenose and Atlantic spotted dolphins and off of Little Bahama Bank. And this is a really cool project. The, these two species live, they co-occur in this area. And so a big part of this, this research was trying to understand how these two species co-occur and then also trying to understand their foraging behavior and nutritional requirements for feeding. So why are they making certain choices on, on eating certain prey based on what those nutrient, the nutrients that are provided by those prey. And so here is a, is a cool example. So for those of you that, that know anything about dolphin foraging and feeding, they're extremely creative and, and, and innovative in the way that they feed. And here's a picture. Um, these are from the Bahamas from the study site in Little Bahama Bank. And these are Atlantic spotted dolphins shown crater feeding. And what's really cool about about dolphins in general and in marine mammals is they can echolocate, right? So here you can see that they're echolocating into the sand, which we can't see, but they're using sound wave, sound waves that are creating an image in their brain and they can actually see the prey in the sand and then they dig into the sand and pull it out. So it's really a cool, uh, cool behavior. And so we, we looked at a lot of those different ways of getting that. And here's, here's another picture and it's called crater feeding because on the right, you can see the dolphin sort of digging its rostrum or its nose into the sand from a fish that it saw and and it digs it out and literally if you look at where there was a feeding frenzy and in some of these areas where they did a lot of that it looks like a mine so there will be just these holes these these pock marks all throughout the sand so it's really cool and on the left you can see they sort of another thing they do other than making um, craters is they buzz they use these high frequency buzzes so they emit the sound into the sand and it returns a signal into their brain and they sort of cruise along the sand and pick out prey as they go along and so you might want to, if you guys have volume at home, you want to crank it up a little bit here. You can get the full effect of some of these high frequency sounds during a feeding frenzy in this area. And so that's just an example. You can really hear the energy in, in the water when there's a lot of um, feeding going on. And so that, that's a typical feeding frenzy when there's a lot of prey in the area and they're, and they're capitalizing on that. And so another cool thing is that um, I really got into trying to understand reproductive status and, and, um, and young calves and how they feed based on their nutritional requirements. So for in terms of reproductive status, looking at uh, non-reproductively active adults versus lactating females versus pregnant females and, and trying to understand if there's decision making that goes on if they need more protein or more lipids based on those those statuses and then also for different age groups of calves so from ages one to three they sort of rely on their mother still that this is a picture of a of a weaning calf or, or a, a young um, individual that's suckling on its mother for milk and supplementing its diet with that. So what are the differences when it's feeding in groups that are with calves feeding versus um, those that are reproductively um, active and then feeding based on that? And so to get at this, basically we used observational studies, decades of this to understand what dolphins were feeding on in the Bahamas in this area. And we looked at those data. And then in addition to that, we also looked, we collected prey using a variety of techniques, or I did using gill nets and traps and everything I could possibly do to collect the prey that we knew that we were feeding on so that I could bring them back to the lab and, and look at uh, what the nutritional composition of those prey were. And so here's just a couple of pictures of me as a, quite a few years ago now, um, doing a lot of different ways of, of catching these fish from spearing them on the bottom to jumping in the water in the middle of the night with a high powered LED light to pull up prey. And then I would literally have to jump in the water and fight dolphins for, for the food that they were trying to get so I could bring it back to the lab. And, and so what, what we learned, so this is from a, um, from a publication based on this, and so the, the main things that we measured were calories, lipids, proteins, and, and moisture in the prey. So a lot of the common nutritional things that you would consider in, in food items that we would eat as well. And then we use these representative nutritional values and observational data to investigate the influence of the nutritional value on prey use. Right, and so the results were basically that um, there were specific nutrients that were targeted by the different reproductive states <clears throat> and age class groups. And you can sort of think about this like, like um, in, in humans, pregnant um, women often like they have cravings for, for 
this and that when they're pregnant. And so it, it looks like the, the dolphins are doing something very similar where they're targeting certain prey based on the nutrients that they have, be it proteins, lipids, or, or other nutrients. And then so the overall results were that for all of those nutrient groups that um, lactating females versus pregnant females, lactating females consumed higher nutrients um, relative to pregnant females. And for the non-reproductive active adults, they consumed higher nutrient levels than, and than um, the reproductive states. So there's something going on there with the way that they're feeding based on um, reproductive status. And the same thing went for calves and, and non-calf groups. So calves that were supplementing with milk would feed um, slightly differently than, than groups that did not have calves in them. And then also there were prey differences. So the, the, on the bottom, there's some images of some common prey in, in the Bahamas that they would feed on like wrasses and, and flounder and flying fish. And so that's general there. And then I wanna move on to um, what I did next. I kind of came back to my roots and looking at Atlantic Goliath grouper and looking at fish like I had started when I was in the Great Lakes. And so this kind of gets into what I started to do for my, for my dissertation work. And this is a really cool picture. So if you ever come to Florida to dive, um, the aggregations are, are a really popular dive destination actually from about July into September. And so this was just taken a couple months ago. And a little bit about the background of, of Goliath grouper. Um, they've, they've been assessed by the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and, and, um, and they are considered re recovering currently in the state of Florida, and I'll explain that a little bit in the, in the next slide or two of why, why that is. Um, so basically, the center of their population is right off the, the southern part of, of South Florida, and throughout the rest of the range through the, um, through the Caribbean into the Bahamas and down to South Brazil. Uh, their populations are very thin, but their distribution continues there. On the west coast of Africa, that population is thought to be extinct at this time, and there's been some genetic um, reclassification. So um, the Pacific live grouper has been determined to be in, um, off California now, which was at one time considered the same population. And so a little bit about their, their life cycle. So this is a gregarious species. They come together in social aggregations to spawn during the spawning season, which again is around July through August, September. They come together in these large aggregations, move from all over the place, from their home sites, come together in very specific times and, and specific sites. And they, they release eggs and sperm in these spawning aggregations. Those fertilize and become pelagic larvae for about 30 to 80 days in, in the open ocean where they then settle down into mangrove leaf litter in <clears throat> near shore environments, grow up, until they're about five or six years old. And then they start to migrate offshore as sub-adults and eventually join these adult groups where then they can add back into the population and as reproductively mature adults and, and form these spawning aggregations. Okay. Um, one second. God, this is, I don't know. Sorry, I, I can't see the top part of my screen, which is really frustrating. Uh, okay, um, I will just have to keep going. Um, okay, so so basically, all um, all groupers share a similar life history. And so Goliath grouper fit into this realm. So in general, there are 163 species of grouper worldwide. And in the Western Atlantic, there are 22 um, species. And generally grouper are very um, profitable commercial fishery. And so they're heavily targeted. So we talk about overfishing quite often with this, with this group of fish because of their vulnerability to overfishing in the commercial market. And generally, um, they're, they're difficult to, um, to maintain as a fishery because of their, their life history traits being that they're slow growing, they are late to mature. So for example, Goliath grouper don't mature until about seven years of age and some of the other species nine years and five years, and they're also long lived. So there's a very slow production rate. So it takes a long time for, um, for generations to, to recover from, from a lot, from heavy overfishing if, if, they're not, if the populations are not managed well. So most, most um, grouper species form spawning aggregations and they, they aggregate at specific times and sites. And so they're very easy for, for fishers to target because especially with the advent of GPS, if you know exactly where those aggregations occur and they're not managed or protected, then fishers can go in and, and exploit that resource. And then that obviously has a lot of harm for the population because they're not 
<coughs> able to reproduce. Many also use nearshore environments like estuaries and nurseries. So for example, gag use um, seagrass, goliath cooper mangroves for five to six years. And one of the problems, of course, with human impacts, which is a huge um, um, concern of mine in my career and in what I've tried to study is how we're impacting uh, the water quality and habitat is that many of these estu estuaries are heavily impacted by, by human activities, development, water quality, that sort of thing. And so one of the big issues is that um, the Goliath grouper, because they were so easily fished, they were fished to near extinction levels by 1990. And a lot of controversy arose recently um, in, the, in the last decade or so as, this, um, as they went from not near extinction levels and they've started to recover. And you can see here from an old fit from before the, there was a closure for the fishery that fishers, um, recreation and commercial will go out and just take as many of these fish as they could because there was very little regulation on it, which is why they got fished out so, so quickly in, in about a decade. And so there's a conservation timeline that, that goes with this because of, um, because of those fishing efforts that, that brought this population down so, so low. So at that point in 1990, basically, they were fully protected in US waters. So it gave them full protection in attempt to recover their population. In 1991, they were listed as candidate for listing under the Endangered Species Act or ESA. And as they started to recover, they were actually removed from that listing in 2006. And in 1993 and in 2002, they were protected in, Caribbean, in the Caribbean and Brazil, although there's issues with enforcement there and, and they still get harvested and poached quite regularly. Um, in 1994, they were considered critically endangered by the internet, by international standards. And just recently in 2018, um, some, because they've been recovering, they're not recovered yet, but they've been recovering. So now they've been downlisted one, one step. Um, they're still vulnerable to extinction, but they're doing a little bit better than they were um, in the early nineties. Um, they're still considered overfished and harvest is still prohibited, but there's a lot of controversy surrounding this right now, which I've given many talks on. I won't go into great detail on right now, um, but in May of 2021, um, because of a lot of pressure from, from some fisher groups, F, um, FWC has now directed staff to draft an initial proposal to outline specific regulatory guidelines for a limited fishery. And then coming up in March of 2022 of this year, there will um, be some sort of a final decision on whether or not that's going to happen. So I encourage all of you to research this a little bit more, contact me, and even um, join these FWC meetings, Florida Fish and Wildlife meetings, and um, leave comments. All right, so some of the research questions then that, that I've addressed and, and colleagues is due to these declining populations and then the recovery um, and trying to understand how the recovery has, has gone. And so that has been sort of the, the umbrella around a lot of the questions I've, I've asked with the species. So trends in population recovery. So a lot of that has been their population and abundance patterns, <clears throat> their spawning behavior and aggregation locations. So when are they spawning? Where are they spawning? Um, and, and, the, and every question surrounding that. Their movement patterns, how far are they moving to come to these aggregation sites? Where are they going in between? Do they have high site fidelity? Yes. Um, we've also needed to know a lot of the basic biology because almost nothing was known about them prior to, um, to early studies. So understanding their age and growth patterns. And then um, toxicity has become a big issue with this species too because, there's, because they're long lived and, um, and fairly high trophically. So they consume a lot of prey that have mercury in them. And accumulated over time. So we've looked a lot at mercury toxicity and, and other toxicants and then what effect that has on their health and reproductive um, potential. And then also what are they eating? What is their diet and, diet and trophic ecology? So to do this, um, I showed you the, the Goliath grouper um, life history of spawning because the, these are the areas that we've targeted now. So the juveniles I mentioned are mangroves and you can see here in the bottom right you need to also have good mangrove habitat, habitat which is mostly in, in South Florida and Southwest Florida, uh, where there's still very fairly intact red mangroves. And you can see those prop roots are very important because they create a lot of structure for the species. And then we also do all non-lethal sampling. And so here on, on the left, you can see a contraption that we, we keep water flowing over their gills and, and as we sample them before we release them back healthy and alive. And then these mangroves are also nurseries for a lot of other species. So this is, this is a cool picture. This, uh, my dad actually came out with me for, for a two week trip and, and a colleague from Brazil and caught his first shark in, in these waters. So that was, that was a really fun trip. So then moving offshore um, to catch the adults and, and the adults get quite large. Um, they, they, 
we know that they live to at least 37 years of age and they can max out potentially at around 700 pounds and then eight feet. So these are very large fish, which is why they are also a very uh, popular fish for catch and release commercial and, or sorry, or the recreational fisheries. And so we, we catch them using hand lines, um, kind of like a tug of war technique, which is the easiest way we found to bring them in fast. We bring them onto the boat, strap them down, um, same as the juveniles, put water over their gills, cover their eyes so it doesn't damage their eyes. And then we're able to sample them before releasing them alive and well. So this is looking at, um, so I mentioned we were interested in their diet and stomach um, contents. What are they eating? What are their um, foraging patterns? Similar to what I was interested in with dolphins. And so here the, the literal technique is to reach into the gut through their mouth and just feel around for things and then pull it out. So that's how we retrieve stomach samples. So it was always kind of like a drawing straws kind of a game to see who had to go in with their arms. We usually made the new, new students or, or interns do it. <laughs> Uh, so, and I mentioned, you know, again, that we did all non-lethal sampling. So here is a, is a technique um, for aging the fish to understand their aging growth pattern. So we, it looks a little, a little crude, but we, we take out a section of their, of their fin rays and they grow back. And you can see that in, um, in the central B photo that's less than a year later, that tissue grows back over with our tag. And what this does is we can actually look at this under a microscope, much like rings on a tree and actually count the years that this fish has been alive. And so there's other techniques that other agencies use to, to take out the ear stone called the otolith to do this. And that's a very um, historic aging technique with that is lethal. So we have developed techniques then to, to make this non-lethal. Uh, drawing blood uh, was an important thing to look at their uh, mercury levels in their blood to see how that's running through their system but also much like if you bring your dog into the vet and do a full um, health panel, you wanna be able to um, look to see um, if these fish are healthy and if mercury or other toxicants are impacting their health in any way. And so you can take that blood and spin it down, separate out the, the plasma layer from that. And that plasma really holds a lot of the information on the immune system, proteins, nutrition, that sort of thing that we can really try to understand the health of this fish. Um, other samples we take, we um, under trying to understand their reproduction, the top left um, figure is, is um, extracting gonads through their urogenital duct. We can literally pump out their um, egg tissue to, to look at those under a slide later and understand more about the reproduction. Also looking at, um, we looked at mercury in those gonads to see how much they were offloading mercury from their own tissues into their eggs, which would have reproductive effects, but be um, sort of a good thing for the for the adult fish because it releases a lot of the mercury from them. So that's it's sort of a weird um, situation. Uh, we take biopsy samples of their muscle to look at their feeding patterns, long-term feeding patterns called stable isotopes. And then the bottom left figure where there's a little stitching thing, we also add acoustic receivers and pinger, or sorry, rather acoustic pingers into the fish, <clears throat> which when they then pass receivers that are in the water, it tracks their movement. So that's how we learned a lot about their movement throughout the water column. And so some of the data then from um, also diving with, the, with these fish and, um, and, and measuring their sizes and then counting the fish using citizen science data and also our own techniques, we basically were able, we published this and we were able to map the population recovery from those early 90s when they were almost extinct. So you can see that on the left, bottom left of, the, of this figure, um, the, the y-axis is, is abundant. And as you move throughout the years, that, that population increases. So that shows the recovery. And as I'll show you in, in a later slide, uh, post this, this publication, the populations actually started to decline being offered still the same protection. So that's a, a concern to scientists currently. One really cool thing that has added a lot of rev revenue and a boon to the, eco uh, the economy in, in South Florida is that people are coming from around the world um, and it's very well known in Florida to dive with these fish because you can't, um, there's nowhere else in the world that you can really come and dive with this many fish in these large aggregations. Um, and so people come and then they're really excited about that. So dive shops have, have shown um, extraordinary increases in revenue. And there's been a lot of also indirect revenue to businesses um, from travelers that come to, the, come to the state for this too. So that's been a really cool thing. And, and this is really a, a point to make because um, eco because Florida has not really recognized this as much, which is why they're uh, considering opening this up for fishery again. They really need to look further into the economics of this because in other places like the Bahamas, where um, they have protected sharks and that's become a very lucrative dive industry 
in those areas and in Fiji and some other areas, they've made a lot of money from, from the protection because people go there to dive with, um, with sharks. And so Goliath Grouper dive tourism is available really only in Florida um, and it's in the sea around, but it's especially um, good during the spawning season when a lot of them come together. And so not only for uh, ecotourism purposes, but to understand the biology, we um, looked a lot at their spawning aggregations, as I mentioned. So you can see a picture on the right of, of what a really big aggregation looks like, and, and you can see why that might be so exciting to dive in. Um, some of these aggregations are more than 100 individuals, and they're all condensed into one, one small spot. So it's, it's really quite extraordinary. And so on the left is a figure from um, a publication two years ago where we sort of map out all the spawning aggregations that we have identified. And most of those you can see that are dark um, objects, dark circles are right in the same latitude in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic of South Florida and down near the Keys. And then there's one aggregation we found kind of in uniquely up in the Northern Gulf of Mexico. And here's a, here's a picture just from this last year. They also, Goliath Grouper, they're, they're big, and, but they're also very good at conserving energy. And so I'm just kind of hanging out with them right now um, in this picture behind a berm. They were, the current was ripping this day. And so they were literally just lined up like sardines down, down this berm trying to get out of the current. And I, I sat down with them and watched them for like 30 or 45 minutes because it was, it was so cool. And then somebody ended up, um, my friend Cassandra ended up taking a picture of it. So I, I tend to love this picture. So this is what it looks like um, from a diver's perspective. <clears throat> and you can see the lasers that I'm measuring the fish with in this video. This is one of the really popular sites in South Florida called MG111. And so this is kind of what it's like to, to dive with them during a spawning aggregation. You can see how many, how many fish there are and how big they are. And you can also see the wedges out of their, their fin rays where I've sampled them. <laughs> so yeah, that's proof that they're doing, doing well after we release them. And then the same site during the non-spawning um, time after they've moved back to their home sites to live, you can see how much different it is. There's still fish here, but they're not quite in the numbers that they are during the spawning season. And so here's just an example of, of a picture that um, a fellow um, diver, Walt Stearns took showing an aggregation. And you can see a lot of the fish even in here that we've sampled. <clears throat> so it's kind of cool. All right, so just a little bit about um, some of the biology of what we've done with the eggs when, when we collect them to understand their spawning. So all this is, all you need to see on the left is, so we took those eggs I showed you that we collected, <clears throat> smashed them down into a slide, look at them under a microscope and look for a couple of things to see if they have, are ready to spawn within a very short window, like a 24 hour window, or they just spawn. So that's what this is showing. The left photo is showing what's called hydrated oocytes or hydrated eggs. The fish pumps a bunch of um, vitiligen or protein and water into the eggs right before it releases it um, to make it buoyant in the water and to give it nutrients. And then right after it releases that, what you're seeing on that right figure is the nutritive layer that's left that was energizing that cell. And so that lasts for about 24 to 48 hours and then gets reabsorbed back into the fish. Um, so you, you know that within a window, if you see these things in these slides, that the fish is, is spawning at this time. So we can um, use that as information to tell us that um, there's a spawning um, uh, behavior going on here in aggregation. And then on the right, one of the cool things that we found is that this fish is also spawning during new moons or the very darkest nights of the spawning season. And we hypothesize that they're doing this because they're trying to avoid egg predators. There's these little fish called scad that follow the fish around and, um, and we think, and they are egg predators. So we think that the fish are, are trying to trick these fish, um, the, the little scads from eating their eggs by doing this on the very dark nights where they can't feed as well. And so what you're seeing on this, on this right figure and where those dark circles are, the, the new moons and those um, the highest bars, is that the percent occurrence of these these eggs that are in condition of spawning are the highest during these times. So that's that's evidence that they're spawning um, in high frequency at that time. And then much like the dolphins that I showed make a lot of noise, well, fish make a lot of noise too. There's a lot of fish that, that make sound underwater, and that gives us a lot of indication as to what they're doing, what their behaviors are. And what's really cool about, about these fish is that, about Goliath grouper, is that they make these very um, loud, low frequency boom sounds and very high frequency during the spawning seasons. So we put underwater hydrophones to record the sound. And, that, and basically what happens is you see these big peaks in sound production during the spawning season and especially on new moon. And then it calms back down in the in-between days and on the off season. So if you have speakers at home and you can hear bass, because this is really, it feels like a sonic boom if you've ever felt that. 
um, when a plane has gone by and broke the um, sound barrier, it basically feels like that underwater. So if you have bass on your computer, I'm gonna play this. Otherwise it's not gonna sound like much because it's so low frequency. But you get the you get the idea. So I would encourage um, any of you to to dive with these fish, um, and and if you feel that boom, you will know it. It'll it'll literally like rock your bones. All right. So I told you we're also really interested in in the movement where these fish go, um, and so so we tagged about fifty fish, um, and um, around like two thousand twelve when, when the study was started, and um, during the spawning aggregations, tracked them to see where they went, what their site fidelity was meaning how, how, um, how much they stayed on site versus moving off that site. And it turns out they have very site, high site fidelity. They stick around these sites, um, so especially during to spawn, and then they go back to their home sites and they stay there for the rest of the year before moving back. And we know they can make these long migrations up to even Southern Georgia, up to 500 kilometers to come specifically to these very specific sites for the spawning season. Um, a little bit about their diet then. So here's another picture of me um, reaching down in, into their gut, sacrificing my arm. They also have these really small pharyngeal teeth. <clears throat> so as you're reaching in, it's, it's kind of it's kind of cool. They think your arm is basically food. And so they'll open up their throat. So you reach in all the way in, reach around, and then you've got to basically push your arm in again so that they release that and then you pull your arm out. If you do that wrong, it'll scrape your arm and, and you'll have all kinds of little cuts. Um, but it's, it's definitely a, a very crude way to get stomach samples. And so what have we learned from that? You'd think a big fish like that might eat something like, you know, other big fish um, but and, and other reef fish and things like that, but they really don't. They're very slow moving. They're not like sharks that bite a fish and like shear it and bite and chomp down on it. They're, they're slurping up fish and sucking um, small fish or crabs in. So they actually primarily eat crabs. So here, um, not to confuse you on this figure, but the y-axis is, is mass. The x-axis is the current. So all you need to know is the things that are in the top right corner are the things that they eat most prominently. So that is mostly crabs. And that goes for the juveniles, which I'm showing here, and then a variety of other things in smaller amounts. And also the same thing for adults offshore. So primarily crabs, looking a little bit like that. Those are some of the most common species. And then they eat a variety of other things too, because they're also opportunistic. Um, this is where they end up having negative um, interactions with a lot of fishers because they are opportunistic. They will grab something that um, somebody spears or fishes off the side of the boat, just like any predator, they'll take that as an opportunity as a, as a fish dangling on a stick. So they will do that, um, as well as eating a lot of other types of prey items. One of the consequences of, of those interactions um, is not just the negative interaction with fishermen, it's also they get a lot of fishing gear stuck in their, in their guts and their mouths and it has negative consequences for the fish. So here, it's kind of a, a, um, a nasty picture, but the top right is one that basically got foul hooked and, and that's its throat that was ripped out. It's still alive, but it, but it wasn't doing very well. It was a bit emaciated. And then you can see some of the, the mounds of fishing line and things like it uh, lodged into, into their throats that we always tried to remove. So some of it's quite nasty. Um, we also wanted to understand a lot of the, uh, the mercury that were in the prey that they were eating. So that was something that I looked at, um, which prey had more mercury than others. So we collected a lot of the prey to try to understand that. Um, so yeah, that was that was a big question. I'm not going to go into detail on, but um, know that is something we considered. So what the what the fish are eating, how they're getting their mercury into their system, um, and diet is the primary way that humans and also fish get uh, mercury into their system is from what we consume. So that that's why that was so important. And then I also tried to understand um, through various techniques how that mercury moved it around in different tissues in their system, and then how they eliminated it. And my cute little. Um, um, animation there. <laughs> I literally did look at urine and feces as well as gonads like eggs and then sperm. So we looked at all of that. And so importantly for human consumption, because we mostly consume the, the muscle or the flay of fish, even though the life group are still protected, they cannot be consumed legally. Um, if you look at the levels that the, the FDA or the um, um, EPA looks at for regulation of, of mercury and fish and what we can consume and what we should consume, almost all of the adults are way above. Some are, you know, some 15, 20 times higher than, than what is um, healthy to consume. So, so that was a big concern for us is, is you know, um, trying to understand how humans would be impacted if they were to eat this fish. 
versus um, also um, trying to understand how that affects the fish itself. So getting into some of the impacts on population recovery, then this is a paper we published last year, which looked at that very thing. So how did that mercury then affect the health and the reproduction of the fish? Uh, this is just a, an abstract um, of that paper. So on the bottom left, you can see some of the very high mercury concentrations with those blue bars that are that are stemming out. Livers have the highest uh, mercury concentration um, next to muscle, and then also eggs and sperm. So their their gonads, the reproductive organs, have the highest mercury of any study that that we could find. And the muscle of this and um, the fillet of this fish had the highest mercury concentrations of any um, large bony fish in the Western Atlantic. So all of this is very concerning. And then we looked at how this affected their health using their blood plasma, like I said, um, and it had a lot of various health effects. And also those mercury levels were um, compared to experimental studies that have been done in other species. And it was shown that the mercury levels in, in their gametes or their eggs and sperm were, were so high, they were likely to cause um, reproductive impacts. So those are all of concern to us. I also said their population had been recovering up until about 2010 or so. And so here's the most recent figure we have from um, some citizen science data looking at their population in the Atlantic from diver survey data. Um, and it shows a decline going on from about 2010 and ongoing. So that's, that's a big concern for managers and scientists right now. And a lot of this is um, also due to their habitat, especially for juveniles not being able to add back to the adult population because around the world and in Florida, um, lots of mangrove habitat has been destroyed or removed or the water quality in these areas is no longer good. You've probably seen in the news a lot of these um, algal blooms and red tide events, which are now occurring more and more rapidly and frequently in, in Florida and elsewhere in, in the United States. And so that's had a huge impact on, on them, especially the red tide um, neurotoxic effects on a lot of fish. And then you've probably seen pictures of dolphins and, and manatees and things that, that wash up from these hor horrible like red tide events. I'm going to um, hold off on showing this video for now, but uh, we have been working um, very hard to, to basically promote the science of, of what we know about the species and, and basically using that science to advocate for science and, and against the opening of this fishery that is being pressured right now. And then we paired with, uh, um, with Jean-Michel Cousteau and his Ocean Future Society and made this video uh, basically asking the public to fight for the, the species to be protected in perpetuity. So if we have time at the end, I'll, I'll play this short clip. Otherwise, it's also on my website that you can view. I'll let you go back on. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so, so kind of segueing from that in, in terms of uh, red tide, I want to move now into a paper we just published last month, actually in Nature, with with a colleague, um, Justin, um, Dr. Justin Peralt, and, and and others. And this was a really cool study that basically got more into the veterinary side of things, trying to understand how to basically recover turtles um, that strand due to red tide events and these neurotoxic effects. So they, they often mass strand when um, there are these, these big red tide events. And so we looked at Kemp's Ridley's, um, loggerheads and, and green turtles um, that, that were stranded and brought into Loggerhead um, Marine Life Center in, in Juneau, Florida. And um, basically, um, a little, just quickly a little bit more about um, red tide to understand it. It's, it's caused primarily by Carinia um, brevis, which is a dinoflagellate. And um, when these happen in, in mass numbers, they release these neurotoxins, which are called brevitox. And so they affect the, the nervous system basically of, of animals that, that are susceptible. Right, and so um, red tide events are almost an, um, an annual in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, humans have a big impact on this. They're, they're natural, but they're happening much more frequently now and in much larger expanses. So that, that is um, it's most certainly a human impact. They're rare on the Florida East Coast. I won't go into the, the details of why that is, but, but that is important to understand. <clears throat> um, and so in terms of these turtles, um, how they get it into their system, they get it into it, um, they ingest it through inhalation of the toxins that are released in the atmosphere or aerosolized um, particles, ingestion through the water itself or through um, exposed prey that, that have succumbed to the red tide and then they eat that and then they get it into their systems. And the SIPS systems as I, um, or the symptoms rather, are, are neurological. So there are things like muscle twitching, circling, head bobbing, ataxia or loss of movement and control of movement. Um, lethargia and, and paralysis. So these are all very nasty things that can, add, um, that can result in, in death. 
um, in a lot of these turtles if they're not um, helped. And so this is a very important study that we that we did because previously the the studies and the therapies that were were offered were basically removing that turtle um, from the brevitox environment and just kind of keeping it and caring for it until it gets better or diuresis. And, and you can see that um, in this right figure here that um, all you need to see here is that there's prolonged days in rehabilitation, some up to 60, 80 days. So they're they're being held. Um, and rehabilitated for a long period of time, and, and many die during that process. That was that was a study in 2013. Now, more recently, this um, intravenous lipid emulsion um, therapy, which this paper that, that we published was about, was used on red eared sliders, and, and basically showed a lot of promise for this being a very good um, new therapy. Um, I should mention that brevitoxins are lipophilic. So using a, a intra, um, intravenous lipid emulsion therapy makes sense because they can remove it from the lipid itself. And so the conclusions from this is that the treatment was extremely effective. In fact, it brought down the levels in these turtles in, in around 24 to 48 hours. And so the toxins declined more rapidly than traditional treatments that I uh, mentioned. Symptoms eliminated um, were eliminated near immediately. And it also um, statistically significantly increased their survival rate by a lot. <clears throat> Um, and this is also important because fast acting treatment plans are necessary if these turtles are not helped um, again then then they will not do well and this is especially important in resource limited um, areas um, so they're popping up if you see these figures on the right these occurrences of red tide and, and strandings of turtles are happening more and more as, as time goes on so um, having ready access to these treatments and, and methods are, are really important um, for the survival of these turtles. And we hope that these methods will be eventually used with other animals and, and other uh, potential toxins from allergies. Um, I have no idea how, do, how we're doing on time, great. so we're, I'm just gonna keep going. <laughs> so I, I wanted to talk then about um, a little bit of um, other work I've done with other grouper species. I've, um, I, you know, I've gotten really into Marine protected areas and ways to manage fish best. Um, this is not an area where there's a marine protected area um, currently, but but there could be with, with some of the research that we've shown and, and others have shown. This area is called Pulley Ridge area, and you can see in the bottom right where this is, and it's right off the southwest coast of Florida near the Florida Keys. And we also um, did this research into the dry tortugas and looking at red grouper and red grouper pits. And what's really cool about red groupers that they're just like a live grouper actually they're both considered ecosystem engineers which means that their very presence and their behavior creates more habitat for more species in that marine community so they're extremely important to the communities um, for all fish and invertebrates for the survival of that entire community um, so looking at the red grouper is important for that from that aspect all right so they dig these pits these solution holes and in the calcareous rock that's in the bottom of, um, of the sea here in these areas. They dig them out, they remove sediment, they create tons of habitat. <clears throat> and so here's a really cool video. It's a little grainy, but um, it shows, I'll, I'll, I'll show it twice. If you look in the top, you'll see a red grouper um, basically digging out the sediment. They, they grab it in their mouths and then they move out of that solution hole and they dump it. And they're doing this constantly and they're and they constantly and you know all through the time that they live in these these holes they are removing it and they are sort of the um the the species that is creating this environment and keeping this environment healthy so you can see it swimming up here swimming away from its pit which was behind it wait for it wait for it boom So it's releasing that. So again, you can see it coming from its pit and it'll do that over and over again. It'll do that day in and day out. And it does, it's sort of like housekeeping. It keeps it clean so that, that those pits stay, stay healthy. And so um, <clears throat> we used a lot of video techniques, drop cameras and things. A big priority there was, was doing um, remotely operated vehicle surveys or ROV surveys as, as you see here. So this is a big part of this research. Um, and, and so you can see sort of the control room on the bottom left of, of maneuvering the ROV and, and watching it and, and monitoring it and recording data from it. It was a pretty major operation. Um, unfortunately, as, as many of you know, lionfish have become a major problem in invasive species in, in Florida in particular. And so that was a lot of the um, species diversity um, was, was likely impacted by, by these lionfish, which were quite abundant in these, in these pits. And so you can see the lionfish on, on the bottom right here. And this is offshore. So um, 
there's a lot of lionfish derbies that happen in areas close to shore where people can go and spearfish them and have spearfishing tournaments to remove them. But you can't reach all these areas. This, this is at a depth of a couple hundred feet. So this is not really a, a major diving area. So they can sort of run rampant in these areas and, and take over, um, unfortunately. So to understand these communities beyond the ROV stuff, we also, as a proper fish biologist, we also want to catch the fish, bring them up, <clears throat> and do a lot of the same stuff I did for Goliath Group, where we kept them, the fish alive, healthy, well, um, drew blood, samples, all the things. Um, and it was a little bit trickier in, in this environment. You can see these traps that we're pulling up on the top left, um, a lionfish that I caught in the bottom right, that's the boat that we were on in the top right, um, a lot of other species in the water um, with us, dolphins and sharks and things like that. Um, but to keep fish alive and to remove the aspect of barrel trauma as you bring them up out of the water column, because um, what happens when you remove a fish that has a swim bladder and you bring it up just like a diver, if you held your breath and you came up a couple hundred feet, your lungs would, would expand and, and basically explode. Same things happen with the fish if you don't vent them somehow in the water and then remove that, that risk. And I'll get into how we, what the methods we um, developed to, to deal with that are in, in a second. But you can see here again, um, because we've made a big effort as conservation biologists to also sample fish by keeping them alive as much as possible. Here's, here's the, the chamber that we came up with. I, I showed you something similar with the juvenile Goliath grouper. And so we keep them in these chambers, keep them alive, sample, tag them, release them, um, sending them down in a cage to get to the bottom where, um, of the ocean where it releases. Uh, because another issue is if you send a fish that's sort of out of it because it's been out of the water and, and, and messed with, um, to get back onto the water column before it's predated um, on by sharks. So that was another thing we had to deal with. Um, so we had a, a cage mechanism that released once it hit the bottom of the water to, to let them um, get back to the bottom. So I'm going to show this video. It's a little bit long, but it's a sweet video um, showing the method that we came up with to vent the fish underwater. And I'll describe it really quickly. So we have these traps that we send down a couple hundred feet and basically and we would pull it up about halfway and we would do this thing called bounce diving. And this is all blue water diving. And so they're very quick dives so that we don't get a lot of um, uh, nitrogen in our systems and doing depths um, dive, dives down to depths of like 100, 130 feet, something like that. Um, and then what this would do is it brings the fish up enough where that where its eyes don't bulge out, its stomach doesn't bulge out. Uh, and then we can vent the fish underwater to bring them up so that they, they don't get the effect of that barrel trauma and they do well and we can release them after we tag them um, so we can do later studies to see about their movement catch and release that sort of thing so it's important to keep them alive all right so that's the background and you'll see some of the visitors we have on, on this trip too <clears throat> so, um, so that's the the red grouper that we caught there trapped in the water so we're about 120 feet down in the water column right now guys And if you haven't blue water dive before, it's, it's a pretty crazy thing to do too, because it's really hard to tell up and down. There's no, no real reference for structure. And my old friends, the Atlantic Spotted Dolphins came to visit me on this trip. <laughs> a pretty, pretty neat experience. Normally with sharks that would come up and visit us, but it's really cool to have something different. And so what you need to do to vent the fish, we did this with Goliath Cooper as well. We would take a venting tool, we got him on the boat, and you vent, you basically release the air from the swim bladder and release it. All right, you can do that on the boat, but down here, because we're trying to do it midwater, we had to somehow puncture their, their swim bladder underwater to release that air so that we could bring them up to the surface. So you'll see me doing that in a second. And so on the tip of that spear gun is a washer that, that, is, that is basically welded on there so that the spear tip can go, only go in a little bit so it doesn't actually hurt the fish and it only enters into the swim bladder to release that air. I missed it on my last one, but you'll see it here. You see all those bubbles coming out? That's exactly what you want. Now the fish is good. It's no longer upside down. It can swim. And you can see that, that air continue to release. That's, that's good. Exactly what you want. You can see the air still continuing to come out. And 
us. Um, close up with a fish, it's really a beautiful fish. And again, the, so the red grouper is also a very popular commercial fish. And so it was really important to understand the, the health of this population in, in the system. These were very curious dolphins. <laughs> All right, so you get a, you get an idea of what that was like. Uh, that, was a, that was a really cool dive. Um, okay, so moving on to some other stuff that um, that I've been a part of in the Gulf of Mexico. Mickey had mentioned when I went to FSU at first, I actually started working before my PhD <clears throat> in response to the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, which happened in 2010. And so there was a big consortia that that was developed um, to basically understand the effect on the ecosystem of that oil spill. And, and so we had a fish ecology group when I was at Florida State University, <clears throat> where we were trying to understand the effect on fish. So we're trying to measure whether or not you could measure various particles that were in um, the fish itself that represented the oil or oil signatures, and then, you know, mercury and other um, health effects of the fish, as well as what community was out there, and then long term patterns of how um, these fish communities were affected by by mercury and, and we caught some cool animals. When you're, when you're fishing at thousands of meters deep, which is where these sites were, you get deep sea animals. So there's a six scale shark, which is, I, I think the, they get up to like 14 feet or something like that, maybe bigger. They're prehistoric, they live hundreds of years um, as far as um, it's known right now and very slow, slow metabolism. And then there's still not a lot known about them. It was a very cool species, very difficult to bring up on the boat. Uh, but we had a mechanism, as you can see, a, a, a basically a gurney that we, we brought up with the A-frame. <coughs> also, some really cool animals like giant uh, deep sea isopods and hagfish. And that top left corner is my visor. And, and I kind of playing around with some of the hagfish slime that um, from handling the hagfish, which are cool animals because basically these are the, the things that enter into like whale, um, whales that fall and die. And they, they use that mucus to sort of weave in and out of um, of tight structures and so it's pretty cool but they have a ton of gross mucus that if you handle them you have to deal with all right so after i did all that i took a little detour back to uh, back to the midwest to indiana where i had a postdoc um, postdoctoral research associate um, position at purdue university in indiana and i did some work on lake michigan there um, understanding decadal patterns in fish communities and so one thing I'll mention to anybody who's interested in marine biology or fish biology in, in Colorado, um, there's a lot of the same techniques that you can use between freshwater systems, marine systems, and I've been sort of going back and forth utilizing these in, in, in different water bodies. And what's also cool about the Great Lakes is that they are giant bodies of water, um, freshwater, um, not marine, but giant bodies of water that are very much like ocean systems in terms, in terms of their um, physical properties and, and um, the weather that picks up and the waves. It, it's a pretty wild um, environment. Um, and so a lot of the same impacts of invasive species and, um, and nutrients and, and eutrophication, all those algal blooms that happen also happen in the Great Lakes, they're, they're big issues. And so what I wanted to understand is how all of that impacted these fish communities over multiple decades. So this is just from a, this is from a paper that's currently in review, will hopefully be published in the next month or two. <clears throat> and I just made a, a general timeline since the start of our study of, of some of the big impacts of the system of Lake Michigan. And so some of you might be familiar with all the muscles that have invaded there, the quagga muscle and the zebra muscle, which have basically, um, they've created this entire benthic um, ecosystem that has changed everything in these lake systems. They filter feed like crazy, remove a lot of the, the nutrients, which actually you wouldn't think of it, reducing a lot of the nutrients and making a system that's very nutrient poor can also have, um, have effects. And so we saw that in this system. Um, and so early on in the 70s, they had these, these um, the Clean Water Act of 1972 was, was there to reduce a lot of the nutrients. And then the, the mussels came in and, and did a number two. And then there's these big invasive um, species that have done very well there, um, other than the mussels like the round goby, uh, which has had huge effects on, on native populations of fish. Um, before that, it was sea lamprey and some other things. So round gobies were a big issue. We also, in, in the 90s, one of the big commercial fisheries there was still um, yellow perch. And there was a big collapse of that in 1997. All right, and so I'm just showing a couple figures here, nothing, nothing too crazy, it's just to kind of um, show some of the major results and why some of this happened. So this is just a total count of, of some of the major species in the system. And the only thing I really wanna point out here, so on, on this y-axis is total counts, the numbers of fish, 
and X axis is the years or the decades that go by. So over time, these are the patterns. What you see in that bottom left figure before the 90s is you see this huge crash, those are yellow perch. So that showed, um, we, we found the signature for the yellow perch population crashing. At the same time, we saw increases in a lot of the non-native species like round goby and alewife. And so there's, there's a big connection between non-native species, invasive species coming in and native species crashing, which kind of went along with a lot of the overfishing that happened too to create this sort of um, compounded effects, effect of, of um, loss of native species in the system. <clears throat> This is just one slide to show one of the major metrics that we look at as ecologists is species richness and diversity. So this is just one figure showing that we saw richness declining um, in native species as, as the um, non-native species increased. And then um, I just wanted to briefly talk about an experiment that I, that I did there just in a, in a couple of slides on, on microplastics. I know that Oceans First is very interested. We good? very interested in microplastics. And so I, I'm a part of two studies right now, one that's about to be submitted for publication um, in the next one I'll get to in the next slide. And so I created this experimental setting where we basically tried to create a, a food web um, in the lab with um, predators and, and two species of prey that zooplankton, which directly feed on algae and also part, and also that algae is about the same size as a lot of the microplastics in the environment. So we really tried to replicate environmental concentrations of plastics and sizes of those plastics to see how that impacted Daphnia and copepods, which are two major um, invertebrates at um, the productive level in uh, marine and, and freshwater systems. So here you can see the picture I took of the algae in that gut following its gut and that sort of snake-like thing, um, gut system. And then you can also see those orange dots, which are all the microplastics it consumed. So they're ingesting both. <clears throat> um, and so this is, the abstract from the from the um, paper that we're going to submit for publication showing the results so it just gives a quick breakdown of the experiment on the left you see the the two species um, uh, the zooplankton that were introduced introduced into this experiment <clears throat> and then we also added predatory cues we didn't want the the fish which were the predators to eat the daphnia we wanted to see how they impacted it because behavioral responses of the threat of predation can often uh, affect things in, in wild systems. So again, we were trying to, to mimic that. So we looked at the effects of prey, um, or sorry, the behaviors of prey in response to predators and, and, and no response. What we found is, um, and then we also added various concentrations of microplastics and to see how that had an effect. And so basically the, the major um, results from this is that there was only a predator cue effect in, in Daphnia where they um, when their predators were present, they only um, consumed fewer microplastics. So that, um, that's kind of an interesting result. But the major result, I would say, is that what we saw is that in the high microplastic treatment, we saw that um, ingestion of, of those microplastics increased in both species of, of zooplankton. And then um, simultaneously, we saw a decrease in, in the amount of food they are eating. So lower amount of, of algae in their guts in both species. Um, and, and then consequently, what we also found is that there was um, smaller body sizes in, in those, um, in the species that consume higher microplastics. So that's a consequence of the microplastic is that there, these um, species are not able to consume as much. So that would have a bottom up effect in the ecosystem where the, they're potentially not surviving as well. They're not growing. And also they're consuming these microplastics. We also saw this in um, chlorophyll levels in the actual um, aquatic medium that they are in. We saw that there's an increase in chlorophyll levels as microplastic was increased, which means that they weren't, you know, the, the zooplankton were not eating the, um, the algae as much. So it was all evidence supporting that there is a food web effect um, of microplastics in these aquatic communities. I'm also working with a student right now who's at FIU on a meta-analysis of microplastics, where we're trying to understand, looking at all the studies that have been done on microplastics in the environment and trying to understand if there's a significant correlation between microplastics that are being um, quantified in the environment and sediment and water with the amount of microplastic that's showing up in prey <clears throat> or in, in the consumers of um, uh, in that environment. So looking at the things that would be eating microplastic and how much microplastics in the environment to see if those both fit the story that higher microplastics in the environment will result in higher microplastics in um, organisms. And with that, I'm done.
So I will take any questions um, that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. It was such a wonderful presentation. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat that I'm happy to read through, or Mickey, if you'd like to read through, um, either works. Then we could maybe start off with those and then kind of go from there if that works for you guys. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, I'd love to do that. So um, let me go back to my list here. Um, it says here, one of the first questions is, um, how long does it take to reel in a 700 pound grouper? <laughs> that was for me. <laughs> Um, well, it depends on how much you've been working out recently. <laughs> no, it's actually quite funny. No, it was, um, you know, we would have every, anybody can do it really. Um, everybody on the boat was given a turn every time when we got Goliath group on the line, there's, there's just a trick to it. It actually happens very rapidly, which is why we keep the hand rope instead of using rod and reel. If you have a, if you have to deal with like letting it out and back in using rod and reel, it would take probably an hour. But using right. this tug of war technique, basically the technique is to get them off the reef, off the wreck, so they can't dive into structure and get caught up in there because then you lose it and right. and then you lose it all together. So basically the trick is to pull them out really quick. They fight a few times and I'd say in total it's five to 10 minutes. And, and, and basically they, they, they're, um, they're slow moving fish. They're, they're a white muscled fish. They're not like tunas. Um, or swordfish where they have all red meat and they can swim very hard, very fast. They tire out, Goliath Cooper tire out very quickly. They only have these short bursts of speed. So you work really hard and actually people would, would get thrown overboard a few times. My, my friend from Brazil who, who works in the species actually like was holding on and got pulled into the water by one. So as long as you can hold on for dear life and then have a couple of tug of wars, you can get one in five or 10 minutes. And, and yeah, and um, it's, it's, it's a very fun way to catch fish. I'll tell you that much. Hey, it sounds pretty <laughs> epic. <laughs> yeah. Um, we have another question is, um, is the sound that Goliath grouper make um, underwater is something that you can hear without additional equipment? Oh, yeah. Can you hear it underwater without equipment? Oh, yeah. Um, any diver that's underwater that, that is, um, when, when a grouper makes a, a sound like that and you're near it, and like you just you feel it in your in your body you feel it in your bones like it, it literally like it hurts and in, in, in a way that i can't describe it it's, it's a very <laughs> interesting feeling um it's it's just a big basically like pulse of energy that hits you um and and they do that you know as an aggressive thing it's the same low frequency pattern that they do um, when when it's aggressive but they also do that very rapidly when they're trying to attract mates and, and bring um, other fish into that area for spawning. So, um, but then we, we can also record that by putting hydrophones in the water and recording that sound to understand the patterns. So that's why we do that. And then um, another question has come in about how do you get urine samples from a fish? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I wish I had video of some of this. <laughs> <laughs> about the same about the same way we got feces and sperm from the fish as well and I, I i i had a term that i coined for it it was probably something i shouldn't say um <laughs> but it basically involved pressing my fist into the into the gut and sort of working it towards the urogenital duct and you had to sort of like time it where you stopped and that would basically release either the the feces the squirting out which was mostly liquid the urine or the sperm and i i, I had somebody standing there with a container as soon as i said that's poop get it or that's sperm get it or that's urine get it and so that's how we did it and we would i would basically it would shoot out like a rocket and i, and I would collect it that way <laughs> yes i've uh, taken sperm samples and poop samples from sharks and so i totally understand what you're saying uh oh my yeah. god that's fantastic. Um, crazy. And, oh, yes. and I, I'll just add like a lot of what would, and they, and there's a lot of sperm that comes out of these things when they're in reproductive mode, the males. And, um, you know, because their swim bladders expand, I didn't talk about that as much in Goliath Cooper, but they're swim, they're in um, somewhat shallower water. And as long as you vent them rapidly when they get on the boat, it doesn't um, seem to cause any, any harm. But because that pressure is being put on their, their system, as we're pulling them out of the water, their, their swim bladders expanded that puts pressure and they will squirt sperm meters into the air when we're pulling them up. And I'm like, that's a male. <laughs> Got the sex down. <laughs> you know what that is. You know what that um, is. Well, we have so many questions. I'm going to keep going with you. Um, yeah, you next one is when do you think the best time to dive with the Goliath grouper without interrupting their behaviors would be? Love that question. So that has actually been, um, 
it's been a question in the dive community because you know a lot of most divers are very conscious of their impact on, on um, behavior and in the ecosystem so yeah you know um it doesn't seem like divers really have much of an impact on the behavior of the species and, and that's anecdotal that has not been studied um as far as i know um but they don't seem to change their behaviors based on divers in the water and there's a lot of divers in the water uh, with the species so i'm not going to say don't go during the spawning season of course that's the most um sensitive time for the species because that's when they're at reproducing and adding back to the population if you're really concerned with that you would go during the non-spawning months which is outside of about july through september so july through september is the spawning season in south florida it's a little bit truncated and earlier in, in that north florida site that i that i showed you so if you go outside of that you'll see a couple fish that are there as residents on some of these sites but I would, I'm seriously advocating for anyone who's interested to go dive during the spawning season. Just keep your distance. Like you respect any wildlife, don't approach it, don't harass it. Um, you, can't, you can't help it if they come to you, um, which a lot of them do. But yeah, I'd, I'd say contact me and I can help hook you up with a good dive um, operation there. Or um, yeah, so I'd, I'd say go during, during the months of spawning season. And, and also I'll say that of all the things that are happening to Goliath grouper in terms of um, the health of their population, the divers have almost no impact on it. It's really, in the catch and release of them also, if it's done well, it, it's fine. But we're really concerned with what's gonna happen if, if um, the state managers open this up to, um, to a lethal harvest of the species, species because one of the impacts of that is it will impact their population. There's no study that um, that has been diligently done to show that that won't have an impact on their population. And we're really concerned and the diving community is concerned with, with how that'll impact uh, not the dive ecotourism, but also the, the species in general. So it's really the harvest of the species that we need to try to protect from happening. So, yeah. Uh, that's, plug. That's, that's, <laughs> that's, um, that's what we're fighting right now, yeah. Yeah. We might need to plan a trip down, a uh, Ocean First community trip down with you, Chris, to come see some of the groupers. <laughs> Heck yeah! See this for in the future. Sure. <laughs> for sure. That's for sure. Floor, yeah. Somebody who cares very much, Rachel, has asked, um, does the puncture of the swim bladder get stitched back up or how does that work? Tell us more. Yeah, these are all things that I did not have time to go into. So this, these are great questions. Um, <laughs> So as it turns out, yeah, the, if, if um, you look at the anatomy of the swim bladder, it's like all these layers that sort of overlap. And so it, it's basically, um, the fish is pre-programmed to, to heal itself when, when, that, when that's punctured. And so it's the same. So basically what we use is a, it's called a trochar and cannula. It's the same thing that's used in, in cattle when they have um, distended stomachs, right? And, and so basically it's inserted into, into the fish, into the swim bladder, just like you saw me do it in that video with the red grouper. And we release all the air that swim bladder releases all of its air so the fish can then swim back down and be good. And then we release the, the part that opens up that hole out of it. Um, and after all the air is released and literally those layers just cross back over, the fish is fine. Uh, we did studies early on diving with them. You saw all the fish swimming back around in, 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 um, in the group again. And that for about 24 hours to 48 hours, they seem to sulk a little bit on the bottom and then take a little bit of time to, to go back to normal behavior. But, um, but beyond that, if they're handled well and invented properly, um, yeah, those, those tissue layers just sort of like overlap and they're fine and they can reinflate that bladder in no time. Yep. That's great. The, uh, Linda also asked how long does it take for the swim bladder to heal? So you were yeah. saying, you know, like, yeah, so we, so early on, we actually got a lot of help from, um, from a lot of fishermen that were willing to help us with it. And we would send them kits and in a video of instructions of how to do it. And so if it's done well, you know, like these, these and, and one of the reasons I'll say that Goliath grouper have, have likely come back from near extinction levels, unlike related species like the Nassau grouper and other popular spawning um, populations that have, that have gone locally extinct in many areas that have been brought down to same levels is because they're so hardy, they can come back and they can do so well out of water, in the water, they can handle a lot of the stress and, and they seem to still do fine. Um, and so that, so yeah, the, these fish seem to, to be able to handle a lot. <clears throat> I have two questions for you. Um, one is, I remember back in the day in Florida, um, that grouper sandwiches in the, uh, in the 80s and 90s were all the rage. And, you know, hearing you talk about the mercury levels in the flesh of these yeah. fish, um, how, how much do people care 
about the health of the food that they put into their bodies? Do you see that mercury levels um, spiking in these adult fish? Um, does it cause pause for people to think about grouper sandwiches anymore? Is that, can you comment on that? I'll make a couple of comments on that. The first is um, one of the reasons Goliath grouper were fished um, so heavily in, in the 80s through the 90s is because it, it is a popular fish in Florida. Grouper. Grouper, I, I told you at the beginning that there's 163 plus um, species as they're being um, re-taxonomically identified. Say 160 some species of grouper in the world, many of which are commercially harvested. Um, but when you go to a, a restaurant or something, you often see grouper on the menu. Yeah. And so you really, a lot of people don't care, don't know what that is. And um, same thing with snapper, all these things like catch to table. There's a huge disconnect in that in this, in this country and others in this country, there's, there's a little bit more regulation of that. If you go to other countries, you could be getting anything and, and you may not know, you don't know where that came from, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, that's, that's sort of a soapbox, but, in, um, but a lot of what was being served in, in Key West at that time was Goliath Cooper that had all these mercury levels and nobody knew it. Yeah. <clears throat> there, there's a disconnect in the way that people think about mercury in, in fish. One is that uh, people want to trust the government to do the right thing and to regulate that. And that's where FDA comes in, but they really can't manage all of that. They test less than 1% of anything incoming um, just to try to get a handle on it. Um, and they're very limited. They have much higher levels than what environmental protection agency says is healthy and other um, department of health and, and other agencies say is healthy. So the legal sale of fish is already higher mercury than, than um, what is considered safe for consumption. So the government has some say in this, but, but, but that doesn't stop the sale of most fish because there's a lot of fish that are even on the market that are very high in mercury and, and Goliath grouper are extraordinarily high in mercury, which is why we're saying like, don't even bother opening up this fishery. It's extremely dangerous to eat. And, yeah. um, but you really have, people really have to take it upon themselves to understand that and to do the research in order to know what the risks are. And, and unfortunately the biggest risks are for pregnant women that are, um, you know, for the development of their, of their fetus and, and then growing children and development. Cause a lot of it ends up being developmental issues that have been reported in, in children from areas where a lot of fish and, and things are consumed, where there's a lot of mercury in the system. So that's really the sadness of this is a lot of people just don't know the information's not easy to, to gain. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around it and the government frankly doesn't do enough to protect us from it. Okay, we have two last questions. So uh, one of them, this is really a great question, I think, um, mangroves. Mangroves you talked about as being important nursery areas for the development of these juvenile uh, fish uh, with, with mangroves being destroyed, um, where are the juveniles going? What's happening to them? That is, that is one of the questions. <laughs> so, so kind of how this, how this goes is, um, you know, I, I showed you that map, if you remember where the, the, the larvae are plastic for say 30 to 80 days. And it's really, there's a, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of loss in the population and that, and that happens with any, any fishery, right? Um, it, it really depends on the recruitment of those larvae into a healthy environment to even get to a, right. a point where they can grow in a healthy environment. So unfortunately, if there's not healthy mangrove around that can support the fish, they just never get past that larval stage. Yeah. That's a great uh, question. That was from Caitlin. So thank that's you. a great question. And so what all, and so in, in, that's a great question. Yeah. So um, one of the reasons why um, a lot of researchers in Florida really want to protect Southwest Florida in um, the Everglades and, and 10,000 Islands is because that is a very healthy, currently healthy, intact mangrove habitat. And that is by far the bottleneck of where a lot of species, including Goliath grouper, really repopulate. And, and that's where we know most of the juvenile habitat is. The big question still in terms of their genetics that are not completely understood is, do all the fish come from there and then make their way back to the Atlantic? Because there's not a lot of good habitat for them in, um, in the Atlantic side in the IRL, which is heavily polluted and damaged and, and developed um, in um, Indian River Lagoon, that is the IRL and, and that whole area. So that's, that's the, I guess, the general um, um, answer to that is that there's a lot not known about that, but certainly the areas where there is very healthy mangrove habitat still needs to be protected because that is the area where um, the bottleneck of these populations are being supported. Yeah. Well, they have, uh, I have one more question and maybe one more, but I, I know everyone's probably getting ready to go, but 
Uh, the last question I have is, why do you care so much about these fish? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> it's a deep, that's a deep question. It's, um, it's not just these fish. I, I think that um, to me, yes, I care about these fish because I've, I've worked with them. I care about them, um, but I care about all of the ecosystems, all of, all of the animals in, in these environments. And what I've sort of developed with, with Goliath Grouper, my relationship with Goliath Grouper is, is I think of them more as a model species for the health of the ecosystem. Um, they really are a model spe species for a lot of things. They, they um, really indicate the health of the, the mangrove habitat, salinity levels, um, red tide events, because they, they die when it's not good, and, and as do a lot of other species. And, and the way that they're being managed in terms of how we care about fisheries, how we care about management and, and animals really is indicative of what we're doing with the species. We're, we're trying to reset the paradigm here with how we manage this. Not every species needs to be fished, right? We, we know that the species is not doing well, even with full protection, even though it's showing signs of recovery, it's still declining. And, um, and I think that's an indicator of how a lot of the ecosystems in Florida are. And so we really need to be looking at water quality habitat um, quality, habitat protection, where we know it's essential for, for the development of, and recruitment and repopulation and all that. And, but then also when you work with an animal a lot, you just, you just become part of it. Like that, that has just been a part of my life for so long. I, I just care about it a lot. And I really think it's in, in indicative of how we treat a lot of the, the species that we handle in the state and yeah. around the world. And so, I, and it brings a lot of people together. I think, you know, it's important for the dive community. Um, it's important for ecotourism. And I just think it's an all around pretty awesome species. Yeah. And, you know, lastly, I would just say that, um, you know, that Ocean First has a new um, home in the Florida Keys. And we're all excited <clears throat> about launching that and, and doing research down there. Um, do you feel um, excited about the, the position that Ocean First is in, in being able to do some research on some of these amazing species and try to unravel some of the mysteries? Oh, gosh, yeah. You saw like all the places that I was working on, there were like right around the Florida Keys and that area. It's such an important habitat. And, and there's a lot of issues in the Keys, too. And, and you know, there's there are things that need to be worked on in, in all of these coastal areas. Florida is an amazing place for production of a lot of different species. Um, and for, you know, and, and there's a reason why a lot of people come to Florida to interact with wildlife there. It, it's a place that where it's easy to interact with things. Um, and I think the, the new dive center that you guys are, are gonna be out of down there is gonna be incredible for, um, to, to, contribute, to continue down that path of, of really um, bringing people in, into the intersection of a lot of the really big research management and species that exist down there. And, and really a lot of the cool systems that you can you can work in and around very easily it's very accessible and heck yeah i'm excited for that <laughs> and we can bring all these things into it like you know there there's so many animals so many organisms there there's there's really just a, a plethora of, of opportunities down there that that haven't been tapped into yet and and people that we can work with down there they're doing amazing things too so yeah it, it's it's a very exciting time Cool. Well, I'm going to turn it back over um, to Megan to, to end us out tonight, but thank you so much, Chris. Yes, thank you. And sorry for some of the technical difficulties. I was working on that. I couldn't see the top row of any of my <laughs> slides. And so I was like, I don't know what it was. It was great. It was great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wonderful job. And sorry, yeah, that I could see that how that could be a little flustering in the moment for sure. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad I feel like it, it worked out towards the yeah, end there yeah. where you could see a little bit more. Um, but this was just so wonderful to have you speak to all of us, Chris. And again, like, thank you for yourself and everyone being so flexible with moving this to a virtual event. I feel like, you know, everyone stayed and enjoyed the conversation and had lots of questions. And I just feel like we're very lucky to have you um, be a part of our organization in the way that you are joining us. And I'm serious. We're coming to Florida to visit you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've only got a two, I've only got a two bedroom place. Like, and you got to have to tell me I can arrange it. Place we'll give that. you a heads up. <laughs> <laughs> well, awesome well, I'm super yeah and, and thank you for having me I, I mean obviously like as a scientist I take every opportunity to want to to want to talk about the things that I've, I've done and, and things I care about and things that I hope other people care about as well so yeah thank you for awesome. the opportunity yeah, yeah. thank you thank you Chris <laughs>